Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining me today to talk about how to accredit conference sessions with CCHIs. Some of you uh, have already uh, done this in the previous years when we were uh, trying different models on how to make sure that conference sessions uh, provide uh, continuing education hours for interpreters. Um, and. Uh, this uh, group uh, that have already worked with us, you know that we tried different things. And we're very happy that since September we have uh, established a new uh, official program which could uh, help us uh, accredit uh, training courses, uh, pro various online programs, and conferences as well. Before we uh, start the actual presentation, I would like to go over a couple of household uh, items. Uh, you all see this um, uh, control panel uh, for go to webinar on your screens. Make sure if you have any questions, type them in that questions section down here where it says enter a question. Uh, and uh, at the end of the presentations, I will answer them. I will also be answering some questions if I see them as I am talking and if they pertain to that specific topic on my slides. Uh, also, uh, you're all muted for the moment because we don't want to have any interference from cell phones, driving, etc. But at the end of the presentation, again, I will uh, ask you to raise your hand if you uh, uh, want to ask a question. So you can see this button here uh, on uh, the four icon uh, slider, uh, raise your hand. So uh, that's the button you'll need to uh, press if you want to ask a question, then I, I will unmute you and you will be able to ask your question. So right now, just for practice, please, uh, everyone, raise your hands so I can know that you found that button. Okay, I see people coming in with raised hands. Not everyone did you find, okay, good, good. Excellent, okay, I, I see that most of you found the hands, uh, raised hands uh, icon, great. So uh, let's dive in into the actual presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to start with the name of the program. It's Continuing Education Accreditation Program. And the words Continuing Education actually define the purpose of this program. Uh, if you uh, uh, think about it, certification is for an individual. That's what distinguishes an interpreter uh, as achieving uh, some uh, certain standard uh, in their profession. And accreditation is a similar um, recognition for a program or uh, a training provider. So that's our distinction. Also I want to bring your attention to the uh, words continuing education accreditation program. We do not accredit programs that are preparing for certification or are beginner programs uh, because this is not something that we can actually even do because we uh, carry the uh, NCCA accreditation for our certification exams. So that's one of the reasons why we don't pre-approve training programs that are just preparing for certification uh, exams. Uh, also, I want to again uh, bring your attention to this dichotomy. Uh, because we have certification and we have interpreters who need continuing education, we have a special uh, set of policies and rules that apply to interpreters, to individuals who need their continuing education. And in those policies, we state that they can take a number of programs who may not be accredited, which may not be accredited with any of the associations, uh, as long as they fall within certain criteria. And that information on our website, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later today. Uh, as for accreditation of the continuing education program, this is more a service that we provide to the industry at large in trying to encourage quality programs to get their recognition and to help quality programs to be marketed and be found by interpreters. So uh, if some of you may have questions, in fact I got some in the email, uh, do we accept uh, programs that are not accredited for us uh, by us? Yes, we accept continuing education hours from individual interpreters as long as they fall within the criteria for those uh, continuing education hours. And that has nothing to do with our topic today, which is how CCHI accredits continuing education programs. So the main objectives 
of CAP, and that's our abbreviation, uh, is to identify on behalf of all the interpreters of the whole field programs that, first of all, help interpreters maintain and develop the knowledge and skills attained at the time of certification. You know, that's the requirement that we actually have to meet to do a good service to our credentialed community. You take a test, you pass it, and as you all know, interpreting skills deteriorate with time. Our field, even though we're not the fastest growing as far as new knowledge is, like we're not IT or anything, but we still have changes in the field, so the knowledge base changes. So that's why it's important that, uh, uh, for at least it's important for us that we accredit only programs which contribute to either maintaining or developing the skills of interpreters or uh, improve their knowledge, enlarge their knowledge about the profession. The next criteria or objective for us is to uh, uh, identify programs that follow quality curriculum development and instructional methodology. We understand that an, our profession is unfortunate. We don't have too many training uh, resources, but we want to make sure that only the ones which really use uh, appro uh, accepted in instructional methodology and uh, utilize the best practices in their curriculum development uh, are accredited by CAP. Also programs that utilize principles of adult learning and are effective in transfer of knowledge. All of you have been to a couple of presentations where the speaker was great and tried to, uh, you know, make us either change our attitude or uh, contribute to our growth professionally or personal, and those are the presentations that we're looking for to accredit. If, however, uh, there are presentations where uh, the person just read the slides and then, then everyone checked, yes, I was at that presentation, that's not what we're looking for. Um, also, we're looking for programs that are taught by experienced educators with proven knowledge in interpreting and healthcare fields. And that's why on our application, you will have questions about uh, how you select uh, the presenters, in this case for conferences, and uh, what credentials they have. And we we'll read their bias carefully because we need to find this uh, intersection of experience in interpreting or experience in healthcare fields because, for example, uh, it would be beneficial for all interpreters to hear about some medical procedure from an uh, MD or an RN. Uh, and at the same time, if an MD or an RN will start uh, talking to us about uh, ethics of interpreting profession, that may be something questionable because uh, they are not experts in that field. So we try, when we read your application, we try to look that the instructor's uh, credentials are solid and they actually have experience in their fields and also are experienced educators because we want to make sure that that transfer of knowledge really happens and it's not uh, just a um, uh, speech that was nice but nobody really learned anything. So why do we want to create conference sessions? Well, first of all, we all at least all of you here with me today, recognize that conferences remain one of the main means of professional educators for healthcare interpreters. Some people think it's a sad situation, some people think it's great, but uh, anyway, most interpreters find their knowledge and their continuing education hours at conferences. At the same time, we recognize at CCHI the importance and value of interpreter associations. These are the organizations that have been promoting professionalism before CCHI existed and will continue to do so for many years to come, and we want to make sure that in whatever way we can, we support them. So by accrediting conference sessions, we would help associations, publicize them, advertise them, and we'll encourage our credentialed interpreters to go to you, to your events, uh, to get the knowledge they need. Also, we strive to encourage a variety of quality sessions which focus on developing skills and knowledge. And that variety is not available in remote areas or in some states or um, you know, for interpreters of certain languages, unless there are such things as interpreter associations and their conferences. So again, this is a win-win collaboration for us, and we really are uh, 
eager to continue supporting interpreting associations. So the next question you may think is why not accredit the whole conference? Why do we go to this trouble of accrediting individual sessions? Well, first of all, most conferences are well organized and they make sure that presentations target different levels of experience of interpreters. There's presentations for beginners and then for intermediate and advanced uh, practitioners. So that's why accrediting a whole conference will not be uh, correct from, uh, for uh, interpreters who already are credentialed. Uh, Another reason is that some sessions focus on business-related subject matter, and they are important, you know, especially if you're a beginner interpreter or even if you're, uh, you know, have been in the profession for a while but you've been staff interpreter and now became a freelancer. It's important to know how to position yourself in our field. So uh, by no means I'm trying to undermine that. Uh, but this kind of uh, subject matter uh, topics do not address the actual knowledge and skills that are needed by the interpreter on the job. So we do not accredit those types of uh, sessions. Same thing applies to most keynote addresses. Uh, I'm saying most because I've actually been to a couple of conferences where a keynote was very uh, pertinent to expansion of knowledge for credentialed interpreters. So again, uh, that's a balance and if you may submit that uh, in your application, but we will need to know exactly what the uh, keynote address would be about uh, and uh, judging by the content, we'll be able to um, you know, accredit it or not. Also, uh, tracking attendance for a multi-track conference is challenging. And you know, most of the conferences nowadays are multi-track. So how do you know that the person attended all three days and every single session and didn't network and skipped one of the sessions? So if you have a certificate which gives you 16 hours of um, a conference, uh, the whole conference, that really uh, is not uh, uh, precise. So that's why we accredit uh, sessions and not whole conferences. When we, uh, we're tackling the question of how to do that, really, we realize that conference sessions have certain peculiarities. Uh, because they're relatively short, that presents a number of challenges. First of all, it's hard to assess if the transfer of knowledge really happened. So we needed to make sure that in our review and application process we somehow account for that because after one hour presentation, it's hard to really teach somebody simultaneous interpreting, really. Um, then it's hard to provide sufficient skill developing practice. That's the example I just gave you. Um, also, it's hard to provide student-specific feedback. And uh, as many of you educators realize that without the feedback, especially at the point where the person is already credentialed, uh, a training really may not be that effective, but at the same time, we uh, realize how important conference sessions are, so we needed to make sure that our reviewers don't penalize uh, applications which don't have that um, question answered. So let me go over some, uh, you know, logistical steps first. Application, uh, it is a two-step process. First, you register your organization. Usually, it is an interpreter association, but it could be a hospital or whatever is the entity which provides the conference. Again, today I'm talking about conferences. This process is similar for training providers or colleges or, you know, uh, standalone trainers, but there are some differences, and you will see that later. The second step is you just accredit your conference sessions because there are two steps. Uh, there are two fees involved and uh, uh, before we dive into that, I would like to uh, navigate you how do you find the place where to start the application. Well, on our uh, new website, which we just uh, uh, released, um, uh, cchicertification.org, uh, at the front page, as you see, there are these four images on the slider. So if you press on the image training providers, you will get the uh, slider open to this uh, banner. And in the banner, you pretty much can click on any of the links, but the most 
the logical ones would be register today or log in to your CAP profile and that will take you to a specific uh, area of our uh, website which is called CAP CCHI which is just dedicated exclusively for accrediting uh, continuing education programs. So that's the home page for that website and uh, right there you can click on different links to actually read more in detail about our guidelines, to check our fees and uh, to have some other information but also if you're just starting your application you press on that um, register with us uh, button or uh, if you already have that application uh, registration in then you press on sign in. So when you uh, click on the register button it actually asks you just for your email and your passwords. Uh, that's to create your profile and after that you can sign in and you can see the arrow pointing at the top of the screen there. Uh, that's where you can also sign in from when you're already on that web page. Um, after that you really start your application and there are certain fields that are very obvious, your contacts, names, phone numbers, addresses. Uh, I want to make sure that if you are going to mainly accredit uh, your conference sessions or specific conference work, uh, specific workshops for interpreter associations, in the description put interpreter association conference organizer. This way we know that there could be two potential types of applications uh, for you. Also these questions uh, go down but I just want to bring atten your attention to the last uh, field, organization web address. This is the web address which will be displayed once you are accredited. So it's, we strongly encourage you to really place the link that points to either your events page or to your conference page somewhere where the interpreters could clearly see what your training programs are uh, because if you pay, put the, just the general homepage address and it's not clear how to find the information about your training programs it'll be hard for in, uh, interpreters to find you. So then you click save and continue and you're taken to this explanation of the uh, registration fee structure. Uh, we recognize that there are two kinds of uh, training providers uh, in our profession, individuals or free uh, in other words, uh, uh, trainers who are not affiliated with organization which are one person deal. Uh, by the way, on a personal note, I was at one personal deal until I uh, started working for CCHI. So, uh, so individuals click at uh, that rate for organizations and interpreter associations are organizations. The registration fee is $150. Um, the fee is annual if you don't accredit any programs and uh, the payment is done online with um, either PayPal or your credit card and I do have good news for all of us for this year 2014 because we're just starting the program CCHI voted to offer a 50% discount to interpreter associations who uh, would like to accredit their programs with SEAP so the fee is $75 for 2014 and to get that fee uh, you know in you need to send me an email and that's my email address managing director at CCHI certification dot org uh, to uh, and I will email you your special code so that the system instead of putting seventy five dollars there is the um, field there said promotional code you put that in click submit and the system lets you continue uh, and uh, the good news further is that if you accredit at least one program a year, you will never have to pay that registration fee again. So we hope that our collaboration is long term. So this year you pay seventy-five and you will dollars, and then you will never have to pay that fee again because you'll be accrediting at least either one conference session a year, or you will be um, accrediting uh, your uh, training seminars for your uh, memberships, etc. But if you don't accredit, if you register this year but don't accredit anything, then unfortunately uh, in a year you will have to renew your registration. So after you pay, you get taken to the screen which is your dashboard uh, of your profile. Uh, you can edit your profile, so for example if the contact person's name changed, etc. You can do that, you can change your password. Um, and you can add program. That button uh, 
big button add new program uh, that's where you will click to start the actual application for a session you can also look um, here in the transaction history on the right uh, you can see uh, upcoming renewals and then past transactions that's where you can get your receipt you can see the transaction number if you need a specific receipt of a different kind please send me an email and we'll be more than happy to issue a receipt at, uh, of a different kind so let's talk about the fees our fees are prorated per hour and there are 60 six sorry six levels which range from $25 to $15 per hour um, some people may say that it is expensive, but at the same time, what we were looking at is the state of the professions in general. We understand interpreters are not attorneys or doctors. They don't make that salary. But at the same time, if we want to have professional recognition, we need to be on par with other professions. So we wanted to uh, we research different fee structures, and we wanted to keep it reasonable for our profession, but follow the best practices of accrediting continuing education programs. That's what we were looking at. We were not looking, for example, at court interpreters or at ATA. We looked at the field is real, if you think about it, is accrediting continuing education for architects, for financial planners, for uh, massage therapists. It doesn't matter. That's the field. So we try to apply our criteria from within that field. So, but. As I said, we kept it reasonable because actually there are some professions when one accreditation hour is about $500. So you realize that that's uh, not something we would ever uh, get to. But um, so to keep in mind that your program fees are based on the total hours of instruction, the tricky part for conferences is that even you submit one session at a time, you need to make sure that you count the total hours of all the sessions you're applying for. And later in this, on the slides, you, I will show you where you put that hour. For example, you found that you have eight sessions. Each is two hours. So uh, you want to accredit 16 hours total. That means that you need to look on our website at the level of um, 16 hours accreditation, which is level C, and it's $19.5 per hour. And your total will be $312. Um, before you pay, again, some good news, um, email uh, uh, me to get the special conference session code. because. Otherwise, if your session is one hour, you will be billed at $25 per hour on a, by our online system. So to override it and to be billed at $19.5 per system, you need to get that code. So that's why uh, we are going to have the slides and the recording of this PowerPoint available on our website permanently so everyone every year could just refer back to these slides and know what to do. Um, what a, our main accreditation principles actually are just uh, three. First, content must be, be of a beyond beginner level complexity so because it's continuing education. In other words, you need to prove to us that they are continuing. They're not beginner level course uh, sessions. Second, uh, content should improve and develop skills or knowledge of a healthcare interpreter. Um, even if you are a provide, training provider for nurses or doctors, but if you have some knowledge that is uh, knowledge fields that are applicable to interpreters as well, you could also get accredited by uh, CAP, uh, and that would uh, be available for interpreters to take. But as a conference organizer, in other words, what it means is uh, everything connected to our professional knowledge uh, will be uh, accredited if it meets other. Uh, principles and then all instructional times time counts in other words you need to subtract all breaks introductions assessment um, and um, the other reminder is that we are credit continuing education hour which is 60 minutes uh, we're not in units we're in hours uh, within uh, our program now what are the topics that's probably something that you really wanted to know from me um, the topics that are most likely to be accredited, again, as I already probably repeat myself, need to align with CCHI certification examinations. Because since they're meant for our credentialed community, 
they took the exams and they need to maintain the skills and knowledge of uh, which were assessed by those exams. So we have two credentials or two examinations, Associate Healthcare Interpreter, which is the core knowledge credential available to all interpreted except those for whom we have uh, oral exam and the oral exam is certified healthcare interpreter credential and it's currently available for Spanish, Arabic and Mandarin speaking interpreters. So uh, just to briefly mention what are the actual domains or subject areas that exam test. So the five domains for the written exams are right here. Managing and interpreting encounter, healthcare terminology, interacting with other professionals, preparing for an interpreting encounter, and demonstrating cultural responsiveness. In other words, these are knowledge-based topics. These are the presentations that, uh, you know, address the knowledge part of our profession. The domains for the oral performance CHI exams are interpret consecutively, interpret simultaneously, cite, translate, and translate. So what that means is that these are your subject matter areas for presentations or sessions that deal with skill building or performance enhancement um, areas. Another news or another uh, surprise is uh, just this week, uh, CCHI updated our uh, continuing education guidelines. They will become mandatory for our credentialed interpreters starting next year, but voluntarily they can follow the guidelines starting uh, Tuesday. That's when they were rela released actually. Each credential holder is required or will be required uh, starting January 1st, 2015 to obtain a minimum of eight continuing education hours in any performance-based training every two years. Right now, we don't have the distinction between the um, subject matter areas, but starting next year, we will want to make sure that interpreters take skill building training, and they may count only up to eight hours in a non-performance-based training every two years. As a reminder to everyone, CCHI requires for maintaining the uh, interpreter's credential 16 hours of continuing education every two years. Uh, and uh, so what is new, again, is that we will be kind of breaking them up into the two areas, performance-based or non-performance-based trainings. And we don't have any limit on performance-based. It could be a minimum of eight, but it could be all 16 hours. But we do have a maximum for non-performance-based. So uh, knowledge-based or performance-based presentations or trainings will, will have to um, account for eight hours of um, continuing education. Uh, now, uh, the details and all the topics listed are on our website, and I just created this little short link for you. Uh, you can click on that from the PDF of the PowerPoint, or I'll show you later how to find the details on our website. Um, so what are the suggested topics? Again, we list many more on our website. I'm just giving you a couple of examples. Let's say for the first domain of our written exam, manage an interpreting encounter. An example could be ethical decision making, including appropriate protocols, interpreting modes in complex situations, HIPAA, patient safety issues, how they affect interactions which involve interpreter, etc. Understand healthcare terminology. It needs to be intermediate or advanced healthcare terminology in both working languages. Again, if you make it language specific, that will uh, more likely be accredited than if it is uh, uh, general for all languages. Interact with other healthcare professionals, protocols and procedures of specialized areas of healthcare. For example, emergency department. Uh, the interesting thing is, I know in the upcoming conference for CHIA, one of the presentations is on emergency department. Is it's as if they read our mind and <laughs> selected that presentation. But that's what we kind of are looking for, to help credentialed interpreter, interpreters enhance their knowledge of specialties within healthcare. And emergency room protocols is one thing. There could be uh, many other speech therapy, uh, sessions for, you know, to end of line, um, and end of life situations, etc. Um, for Performance-based um, trainings uh, for consecutive interpreting, uh, 
the suggested topic is anything which is language specific or specialty specific and is skill building and consecutive interpreting. The same thing for simultaneous interpreting. Slight difference for site translation and translation. It's uh, in the those skills we uh, would. Uh, pay more attention or favor for accreditation uh, presentations that focus on language, let's say site translation for Russian interpreters, right? Or uh, document type, let's say site translation of uh, consents to uh, studies. Uh, or specialty, which would be uh, pediatric documents for site translation or translation. I do uh, mention here translation. Until now, we did not accept any translation uh, workshops uh, or training courses as a continuing education. Uh, we are accepting up to two hours of topics based on healthcare interpreter related translation uh, for uh, CEs for our uh, credentialed interpreters, which means that if you are a conference, um, especially ATA, that's pretty much who it affects most, is that um, uh, the uh, conference, uh, ATA conference, even attending a translation related topic could count two hours of it. And again, as I said, these guidelines are already available on the website uh, and uh, I will actually um, show you a link in a second. Uh, the new area that we uh, are going to um, allow and accept as continuing education for interpreters is demonstrate near-native language proficiency in working languages in the following areas. Uh, slang, regionalisms, and idiomatic expressions. And I just saw uh, a couple of, uh, of you wrote that ATA has many interpreting sessions. Absolutely, because of this whole interpreting division and medical division which uh, has a lot of um, presentations for interpreters. But what I'm saying is uh, ATA sometimes has more opportunities which are for translators, which they should, right, since they're Translators Association. So we wanted to make sure that we include them into our um, collaborations and not just interpreting associations. But um, again, these new three areas for the improving the person's or interpreter's uh, language uh, ability, proficiency are in, uh, approved now because in the past uh, everything was focusing, focusing just on interpreters, but if somebody will come up with something like idiomatic expressions for pain-related uh, situations, that would be something that will be uh, really uh, very um, uh, welcome by um, CCHI. So once again, our website has more examples and I'm going to switch from the PowerPoint to the website to show you where we are uh, with this. If we go into um, our home page, right, right here, uh, the top navigation bar called CCHI Community, and then we go to Credentialed Interpreters, that's the top link here, and within that is the Renewal Criteria, or Renew Your Credential. You can click on either of those and you will get to that. So I'm clicking on Renewal Criteria, and here is the page which lists, kind of in the middle, important update. And that important update includes all the information and you I'm keep scrolling so that you can see there is actual breakdown on how many hours um, are accepted for specific domain. That is not really pertaining to you as a trainer in, directly because it applies to credential holders. But you as a trainer can see, like, for example, uh, the most uh, accredited knowledge-based trainings would be healthcare terminology. All eight hours are accredited. So you may think that those are the presentations you may want to favor because, for example, prepare for an interpreting encounter, only two hours would count. Uh, and that's kind of logical because if you're credentialed interpreters, we recognize that you probably should already know how to prepare for an interpreting encounter. However, obviously, there may be some new um, nuances to it. And then we have a whole list of accepted C topics. 
and here they all are and I'm not going to read all of them I'm just scrolling down to show you that how many they are and then underneath that there are the current uh, guidelines 2011 guidelines which are still in effect until the end of this year but uh, we hope that interpreters would uh, voluntarily start adopting the new guidelines this year as well so let's talk back about the application for um, accrediting conference session. So program name, you need to put the name of the actual session as it will appear on your schedule. And my advice to you, to you when you talk to presenters or when you select this, uh, they uh, will be better off if they have a descriptive name, yet at the same time very clearly addresses the issue of being continuing education. I've seen a couple of wonderful, and actually I've been to a couple of wonderful presentations which were called 101 or nuts and bolts. Well, for a reviewer, one and one and nuts and bolts really means that it's a beginner level presentation. And that's why usually if that's the title and nothing in the application will convince us that this is continuing education, we'll have to email you again and get the abstract and get the handouts so that we can clearly see that this is continuing education. But if the program name is already descriptive enough, that would be speed up your application as well. Program description, that's description will be public on the website. So make sure that you are pretty much put the abstract of the conference sessions here which addresses the uh, uh, content of that session. Uh, the questions on the application do ask for program goals and learning objectives. So uh, if you didn't ask, I'm sorry I'll go back, if you didn't ask your presenters to provide learning objectives as a conference organizer, you will have to come up with this answer based on the abstract, uh, but I just advise you to ask your presenters from the very beginning, and I know my conference, most conferences do that, but just in case you don't, uh, institute it as a new policy to ask for learning objectives from the presenters before you uh, approve their presentations. Knowledge domains, but it's a drop-down list which corresponds to the exam domains that uh, I just showed you. Um, then there is a question number five about program information that is addressed in the program's descriptions, publications, announcement, and advertising. For that, the answer for conference organizers, just put instructors, select instructor or teaching team qualifications. That's the easiest thing to do uh, to uh, answer that question. Question six, describe how this course was designed for interpreter associations. Your answer put conference session don't need anything because uh, you were not designing that course obviously. Select teaching methods, again you put conference session or if it allows you select whatever method which is uh, the closest to that uh, specific session. How are students ex engaged again conference session? What types of feedback if any are provided to students conference session? I'm giving you all these answers so that you can speed up because if you have to upload 10 sessions for a conference, that's a lot of work. So our reviewers agreed that these will be the answers accepted for interpreter associations who accredit their sessions. Next, uh, how many hours is the program? This is where you will need to put all the hours you're applying for. Remember how I had an example about 16 hours for eight sessions? That's why you put 16 hours. And then how many hours of the program are instructional? That's what you put the actual dura duration of the session. Uh, we, uh, how do you document the students, uh, that students have acquired the knowledge and skill? Again, just put conference session. How does the program document that the student has successfully completed this course? Um, here I suggest, you know, to clearly describe to us how you are keeping track that people attended your uh, specific session. It could be um, sign-in sheets, you know, I know I've been at some conferences who just have sign-in sheets for each uh, session and then they keep those, or the other version I saw when a person is given from day one their own kind of journal uh, where they go to a conference and they have the presenter mark that they were there uh, or sometimes it's a similar thing but it's an honor system but anyway that's where you need to describe uh, to us how you keep track that people attended that session. Does the program keep attendance records and for how long? Uh, that's whatever your internal policies are as an association 
could be permanently, could be two years, etc. Who is eligible to participate in this program? That's where you need to indicate the level. Like some conferences, for example, have already, and that's what I, you know, I keep giving cheer examples. It's just because it's coming up soon. But in general, uh, some conferences like cheer, they list uh, level one, level two, level three. So that's where you will put that or begin an intermediate uh, so that it's clear. It's good if you have them specific. You can put all, that's not a problem. You can put beginner and intermediate, that's not a problem. The problem will be if it says just beginner, then you will be not accredited. Um, how is this course delivered? Select all the apply, but mostly it will be face to face or in person. I forgot what our drop down list is, but uh, if it is online, that means that we will have to ask you for more information uh, to make sure that we know how the attendance of an online uh, session is kept and what are the um, steps within your uh, presentation that to show that the person has been sitting in front of the computer uh, during that presentation and didn't just uh, go and uh, do their business. In other words, are there some polls that people need to answer or what are the uh, mechanics of keeping track that persons are present during the online presentation? 17, in what language? That's you know what to answer here. 18, the same thing. What are the handouts? In what language? Uh, 19, what methods are used to evaluate the effectiveness of this program? Again, uh, for simplicity, uh, just put conference sessions. What is the cost to participate? There's a drop-down list. You select what is the cost of the conference. Who teaches the program? It's important to uh, put here your methodology of how you select presenters. It could be very simple. Presenters selected by the board or by the conference committee. We don't need a uh, um, dissertation here. Uh, full name of the program's presenter. It's number 22. Number 23, describe the requirements for or qualifications required of the program instructors. It could, you could do two ways. You can either list your criteria if you have them internally available uh, and if you have only like a couple of uh, sessions to upload. If you're uploading 20 sessions within a week then you probably want to kind of uh, make a short description saying uh, presenters are selected per association's cr criteria available uh, by request, something like that. And if we need them, then we will ask you for those criteria. Make sure you do have the bio, and then you just cut and paste it into the um, answer. Uh, how are the program instructors recruited, trained? It's the same thing. Uh, Either you put presenters are selected by the board, for example, or presenters are selected based on criteria listed in number 23 if you listed some criteria. Uh, so those are the questions on the application. So the application also asks you to upload doc documents. Uh, really, you need to upload only documents that help you prove that you meet the three main accreditation principles. In other words, it will be your conference schedule, which will tell us the duration of the session and the level of difficulty if you mark it on your schedule. Presenters buyers, if you for any reason didn't copy and pasted it in that respective uh, question, then upload uh, them. And then session abstracts with the learning objectives. So so this way, again, uh, we can uh, see, if especially if the abstracts are longer than the description that you uh, provided with the application. Um, when a program is accredited by CCHI, you are able to be found by credentialed interpreters uh, and your listing uh, will be uh, on this page of the CAP section. So people will be able to search for you by organization. So make sure that you know you put your name correctly by the state, by the price range, subject matter, etc. and deliver a method. That's why if your conference session is also available online and face-to-face, -face, make sure you do both. Uh, otherwise people won't find you if they search for just for online training programs. And your listing, and I, this is not in a conference session, it's just a training program already accredited by us. Your listing will look like this. So you can go to the website right now and actually read other listings, but this is your um, 
you know, this is the information, uh, and uh, I'm pointing, uh, the arrow is pointing here to the program ID. That's the unique ID number that accredited programs are listed, and that could be used in your notations, uh, either on the promotional materials, materials or on the certificates. We suggest, like, two versions. One is CCHI accredited X number of C hours for the conference. Accredited conference sessions are, and then you can list them all. Uh, or you uh, can also say C, uh, CAP, CCHI org for confirmation if people are not sure which conference sessions are accredited. Or you can, if you're issuing a specific certificate for attending a session, you can say this, this session is accredited by CCHI for XC hours accreditation ID, and then list that ID. This last notation can also be on your website uh, or uh, in your conference program. Um, where do people find you? If you go back to our home page, uh, you will notice that there is this blue three uh, blue buttons, get certified, find, find a credentialed healthcare interpreter, and find an accredited training provider. So every interpreter who comes to our website can find uh, accredited programs by pressing this button, and they're taken to that screen that I just showed you in the previous two slides. Um, and uh, we also have here different uh, other options. So if you would like to advertise a little bit more, uh, then you can uh, have an advertisement section here, the orange button right below the, where we can uh, specifically advertise your conference. But for that, you just need to uh, contact me and we will uh, describe to you our advertisement policy. So before I open the floor to the questions, tips. Do ask presenters to indicate the level of audience that they are targeting. It's much easier for you to accredit a session if it clearly says beginner, intermediate, advanced. Do ask for learning objectives because otherwise you have to write them up yourself when you do the application. If you have several tracks, and most conferences have several tracks, and especially if you don't have too many uh, sessions accredited, try to schedule those accredited sessions sequentially because it's the uh, saddest situation when you had, let's say, 20 interpreters who start thinking whether I should go to track A, which is accredited, or track B, which is accredited. And then for half a day, there are nothing accredited. So when you're compiling your program, pay attention. Uh, if you know that you will get accredited, then uh, try to get them one after the other, and then credential interpreters will be able to attend as many um, sessions as possible and earn as many hours as possible from your conference, and that will increase the attraction uh, of your conference to interpreters, too. And when selecting presentation, uh, favor language-specific or skill-building topics. Now, I've been in the field since 2000. I have not attended, and I don't say I attend every conference, obviously, but I have not attended a single conference session which said Arabic consecutive interpreting skills, so terminology for Arabic interpreters. So if you know of anyone, I'm serious, uh, please send me a link because I would like to then publicize that trainer, that course to our credentialed interpreters because we've been asked a lot about Arabic, Mandarin. Those are the two languages we offer uh, certification in addition to Spanish. But also for all other languages, you know, I love going to conferences where I, as a Russian interpreter, can go and visit Russian sessions. So those would be, you know, favored by CCHI because those are the actually uh, help interpreters maintain and improve their skills. And then a couple of uh, websites. So the application site is CAB CCHI, and if you have any questions, you can either direct them to me, which is Managing Director uh, at cchicertification.org, or you can send them to our general email, it's info at cchi.org, and a uh, respective person will take care of it or forward it to me about uh, uh, if they cannot answer that question. Uh, I was also, I also wanted to show you quickly um, where you will be able to find this webinar recording. So again, if you're going to, let me go back to homepage. Um, so 
in this top navigation bars, if you go to Stay Informed, it's in the far right, Get News, the first link, and then here you have CCHI webinars, and if you click on that link, here you will have, instead of the announcement of today's webinar, it will be probably below here, past webinars, that's where there will be the link for the recording of today's webinar, and also the PowerPoints uh, that you could download and refer to as you uh, fill out the application. Uh, before I open the floor uh, to questions, I'm going to address some questions that already came in as I was speaking. Oh, I wanted to uh, show you one more thing. Uh, we also have um, uh, Facebook and Twitter, and uh, I wanted to, if you're interpreters or if you have a lot of interpreter friends, please refer them to our Facebook. We have different tips uh, during our testing windows, and right now we have the testing window till February 15th, and uh, so we will be periodically uh, putting uh, their information that uh, is available on our website, but people may have overlooked it or it's not available on the website, like, for example, a picture of the actual headsets that they used, and people sometimes click mute button when they shouldn't. So with that, um, let me put back this slide with the information for our Facebook and Twitter accounts, and meanwhile I'm going to look at the questions that came in. All right. Um, uh, last year at our hospital we held an in-house staff training, one hour, for interpreters on how to handle job-related stress. It was not specific to interpreting, but dealt with stress and mind fullness practices to help lessen it. Would this be something that would be accredited for at least counted towards CAUs? And the answer is actually yes to both. Something like this will be accredited because um, it does help credentialed interpreters to improve their performance. They will learn how to manage stress better. And that's not something uh, necessarily basic or novice interpreter uh, will know. Um, Another question. I work at a hospital as a full-time interpreter. Will CMEs, which is continuing medical education, be used as a continuing education? Well, with that, it, it is a question definitely related to individuals, right? Not to accreditation of programs, but to individuals. And uh, if the CMEs relate to the topics that are listed uh, as suggested topics, then the answer is yes. Uh, one of them which comes to my mind, like patient safety or universal precautions, updates for new um, practices in uh, that area, that would count because it helps you since as an interpreter you will be exposed to blood, to uh, other safe issues that are specifically clinical, but uh, you need to know how to handle yourself. Um, now, another question I got in the email, let me open that. Um, oh, I think I already answered those questions. One is, does the NCCA accreditation allow CCHI to accredit educational programs besides just certification of interpreters? And again, uh, I mentioned that earlier, NCCA accreditation states that we cannot accredit programs that prepare for certification but there are no uh, limits on what we do with continuing education. And that's why, again, to answer your questions, uh, are not um, really uh, pre-approved by CCHI, but we evaluate them with application. Um, another question, would classes as CPR and blood donation count as credits English and Spanish? You know what, right on the fly right now, I am not sure. Uh, I will have to uh, defer to a panel of our reviewers, uh, and maybe if I will will see more handouts and see if, uh, you know, you said Spanish and English, and that's what's Juan, I mean, let me see if I can unmute you for a second, and if you can uh, clarify to me. Oh, no, he uh, doesn't have the right, I don't see him on the things, but anyway. Um, Another question, uh, if my session is already accredited by IMIA, do I need to submit accreditation to CCHI as well? And that was, I'm on YouTube, that was from Alberta. Uh, and uh, 
whatever is accredited by MIA is following their accreditation uh, standards. Uh, CCHI is a different entity and we uh, review accreditation programs for our interpreters and we advertise them to uh, on our website. So accredit it doesn't mean that IMI accredited courses are not accepted as continuing education for interpreters. So if I am an interpreter and I attended an IMI accredited course, if that course was on the subject that we uh, recognize as uh, valid for our certification, yes, that would be counted as continuing education. But if you are a trainer and you offer a course and you are accredited with IMIA, to earn our accreditation, you need to submit the application and accredit it separately. Uh, Alberto, do you have any other questions? Uh, okay, uh, there was also a question about the annual fee. Thank you. Um, the question about the annual fee if it is uh, for a program, because it is a conference session, uh, most likely your conference sessions next year will be different, so it will be a new fee. But if for any reason you have the same session, or if it is a training provider who accredits that session, then there is an annual fee for accrediting the program. And that annual fee is at 80% of the original fee. So you pay less uh, every uh, hours. Um, I also have, uh, let me see, I see a hand raised by Jose Garcia. So let me unmute you. Jose, what is your question? Hello? Oh, I don't think there is a question. So uh, then Juan? Juan yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes, it's me. I, um, I was going to ask a question about the, um, it's a training for CPR, AD, and um, blood donation. This has to do with, I work for a community-based um, County Hospital, and uh -huh. um, we do on-site translations for the hand handout, and uh, and uh, we print them, and also we give them to the um, Hispanic population, as well as the um, English-speaking population, and um, and it's a four-hour, it's um, it's a it's a class when it when it comes to the uh, blood donation, and of course the CPR and AED evaluations and the uh, on-site uh, training, does that, I would like to know if that counts as uh, uh, four hours twice a year. Again, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I'll need to, again, refer this to our panel of reviewers because to me it sounds like there is a Spanish component to it. So theoretically an interpreter will learn some Spanish terminology about that potential they may interpret for situation with blood donation. So the blood donation sounds like something that could be it, but CPR means that the person will be trained to perform CPR. Uh, and uh, here the, it becomes too complex. So again, thank you for the question. Uh, I have your email, or if I don't have your email, send me an email, and then I will uh, have the answer for you and try to post it on uh, Facebook, because it is a very interesting question, and many interpreters have to uh, take uh, CPR training. Uh, another question is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, recently CCHI gave a webinar for trainers. Does this mean an interpreter that is not a trainer cannot register to listen to this type of webinar? No, the webinars are open for anybody. And sometimes, you know, le learning uh, the things that we're talking to trainers about are helpful for interpreters as well. Um, and uh, I see, uh, Jose, you changed your mind, you have a question. So. Uh, if an interpreters association organizes a conference and accredits 10 workshops, do we need to issue certificates for attendance for each workshop? Uh, I would say no, because that's a nightmare logistically. Uh, but what I would encourage is to provide the attendees, and I think I saw it at um, in Tennessee at their conference one year, uh, that uh, they, you get the sheet with the list of all the workshops and as you go to each session you have a um, presenter put initial that you were there at that session so at the end the uh, interpreter has that 
kind of journal of attendance and the certificate and they can submit both to us um, when they renew their credential and this way we can see that they really attended the sessions that were accredited or are approved for continuing education. Um, let me check our time here. Yes, we're right on time. It's 2 o'clock now. Um, and uh, I have the last question which came in is, if I accredit my session, can I use CCHI logo to advertise? Uh, the, when we accredit the, your session, we'll send you an email with an explanation of how uh, it is done. So uh, thank you very much for coming today. We had actually a great audience. I saw about 25 people online at different times. Now we have 23. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me.